Hello, statisticians. Mr. Young Saber here from Skew the Script. Today we'll be talking about bias sampling in a few situations, testing during COVID-19, college admission statistics, and one of the most famous stat solutions of all time from one of my World War II heroes. Let's skew it. Today's lesson is on bias sampling and conducting a simple random sample. This is lesson 4.1 in our course sequence. Today I want to introduce you to Abraham Wall. He was a very famous statistician and he worked with the Allied Forces Statistical Research Group, which helped fight the war effort during World War II against the Nazis. Abraham Wall is a hero of mine, not just as a statistician, but as a person. He grew up in Hungary and he was Jewish. He escaped Europe before the start of the Second World War. Unfortunately, his family was not as lucky. Most were taken to the Auschwitz concentration camp, and I too am Jewish, and a lot of my ancestors were also killed in the camps. They were taken to the Buchenwald concentration camp. And so Abraham Wald, while working in the United States, wanted to help the war effort, and particularly, he didn't know what had become of his family, and he wanted the war to end as quickly as possible so that potentially he could save his family members. And with that in mind, he tackled various problems, and I'm gonna show you one of them today. It's a very famous problem called the bullet hole problem. And we're gonna discuss it at the end of today's lesson, his brilliant solution to the problem. So um, we're gonna talk about this question, and I'm gonna frame it later on in the lesson. So this is lesson 4.1. If you'd like to follow along, please go to the URL here to print up our handout for guided notes. First, we're gonna talk about sampling and from a population. Here's a population. It's all individuals in a group. And if you want to figure out an aspect of the population, one thing you can do is do a census. That's when you collect data on every individual in the whole population. Censuses though are very hard to do. It's hard to find every single person and it might just take a while. So instead, most of the times, if we want to estimate something in the population, we get a sample. A sample is a subset of individuals in the population that we can easily measure and then make inferences about the whole group. Because it's hard to measure everyone, it's usually easier to do inferences. And this is the study of statistics, the study of using samples to make inferences about populations. Now, there are good ways and there are bad ways to do the sampling. And we're going to talk about some bad ways first. Um, so one statistic a lot of colleges report is their job placement rate. Many colleges advertise their school by sharing the percent of their graduates who are hired full-time and or pursuing further study say in graduate school. And we're going to look at the legitimacy of these statistics and see are they being misleading potentially. This is Southwest Tennessee Community College and going to a community college to your school there are several sets of good outcomes you'd want for your students. You can graduate with an associate's degree, a two-year degree and get or trade certificate. Um, you might transfer to a four-year university and take your credits along with you, or you might immediately get a job after your two years in your field of study. The homepage of the website for this college at the time that I accessed it has this boast. Our overall graduation placement rate is 98.5%, with 91% working in their field of study. Pretty high rates. So, the language is a little bit vague here, but my best guess is that means that 98.5% of the graduates transferred to a four-year university or found full-time work. That's what I'm assuming. But note how they frame it. 98% of graduates. That's really key here. It's a graduation placement rate. It's just of the graduates. So let's think about how they're doing their sampling. If you're sampling only the graduates from all the population of students who enter the school, that raises the question, how many students didn't successfully graduate or successfully transfer? So thankfully, by law, most colleges have to report graduation transfer rates and that data is publicly accessible at this website here. So I went on that website and I found out the stats. Overall, 27% of students, just a little bit more than a quarter of student, had one of these outcomes, the ones who entered in to this community college. Only 1% received a certificate within eight years of entering the college. 11% received an associate's degree within eight years. 2% enrolled, were still enrolled in the same institution after eight years. And 13% were able to enroll or transfer to a different institution within that time. So yes, maybe a high portion, 98.7% of students who received their associates graduated, 
got jobs. But the other 73% that's not covered here, who knows what happened to them? This is an example of bad statistics, BS, because you're cutting the data to make things look better than maybe they actually are. This is bias. Bias is a study flaw that leads to unrepresentative and or inaccurate estimates. And specifically, this is undercovered bias. That's when part of the population has a reduced chance of being included in the sample. In this case, what was undercovered was the students who did not graduate. We don't know what happened to them. Let's look at another example of this. This is Rogers State University in Oklahoma. This is a four-year university. They happen to award both uh, two years associate's degrees and four-year bachelor degrees. In a recent report, Rogers State University found that 75% of graduates were pursuing another degree or had found full-time employment by their final semester. Now, something's going on here with the of graduates, but I want to focus on a different type of bias here. How did the university collect this data? How do they find this data out? Well, they use surveys. And the same report that I got that statistic from shows that the response rate to the university's question survey that I sent out to the graduates is only 20%, so only about a fifth of people they sent the survey out to actually bothered to reply. This might lead us to think maybe there's some bad statistics going on here as well. How could bias in this sampling method affect the estimate? Well, this is an example of non-response. When individuals have chosen for, a sample, chosen, for example, choose not to respond. This leads to bias if those individuals differ from all the rest of the other respondents. So let's talk about how the bias might look in this case. And when writing about a sampling bias, there should be three things you're doing. One, identify the population in the sample. Two, explain how the sampled individuals might differ from the general population. And then three, explain how this leads to an over or underestimate. So let's do this in this case. How could bias in the sampling method have affected Rogers State University estimate? So let's identify the sample in the population. The population is all graduates of Rogers State University, and the sample they got is just the graduates who responded to their survey. So that's what it kind of looks like. And we can posit that maybe grads without jobs might respond to the survey less often because maybe they're a little bit ashamed and they don't want to necessarily respond to the survey because they haven't found the job yet. So here's an example of how this bias might look and how you write a model free response uh, answer to this. Graduates who didn't find post-grad employment may be ashamed, making them less likely to respond to the survey. Therefore, this sampling method may include a lower proportion of unemployed graduates than in the full population. This produces an overestimate of the true percentage of all graduates who are actually starting full-time work. Because we have fewer unemployed people in the data set, that actually bother responding to the survey, it makes it look like everyone, for the most part, or a very high percentage of people got jobs. Um, this is an example of how to write up that kind of response. Now, there's other types of biases as well. There's voluntary response bias that occurs when a sample is composed of volunteers who may differ from the individuals who choose not to volunteer. Um, and so, for example, maybe you have a study about exercise and you sample the very insane people who would volunteer to do an exercise study and actually exercise for you. Uh, but those people might differ from the rest of the population who doesn't like to exercise and there could be some bias there. Um, now, these categories, under coverage, non-response, voluntary response, they overlap in some cases and it's a little bit fungible what goes where. So in a free response question, if you're asked to identify the bias and what my bias might be involved, don't worry about using one of these vocab terms. Instead, just describe the bias that's going on, how it arises, and whether it leads to an under or overestimate. Usually, if you do just that, even without using these terms, you can get full credit if you've done a very good job of it. There's also other types of bias. There is survey bias. So there's a couple types of this. Question wording bias. That's when survey questions are confusing or leading. So for example, Maybe you have a question on a survey about TV. Which show do you prefer? Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, hosted by the incredibly talented, funny, and interminable mayor of Flavortown, Chef Guy Fieri, or Iron Chef, hosted by the boring Alton Brown? Obviously, that question is very misleading. A lot of times, it's a lot more subtle than that, but look at the survey questions and make sure they're not leading or uh, show favoritism uh, in this case. Of course, Guy Fieri, we all know, is better than Alton Brown, but yeah, let's, let's at least keep it fair. Now, self-report response bias arises when individuals inaccurately report their own traits. So for example, a survey question might ask me, Mr. Youngster, how much can you bench press? And I would say, of course, I bench press 350, 350 pounds. 
I can't actually do that, but I might lie. Or sometimes self-reported bias is not even lying, it's just unintentionally not knowing, and so you put something down because you don't really know. So that's another bias that could arise. Again, don't worry so much about the vocab, worry more about describing the bias and where it comes from, does it lead to an over and underestimate. Now let's talk about one way we can avoid bias, that's through a simple random sample. In order to avoid bias, you must randomly sample. And one simple way to do this is through a simple random sample. That's a sampling method in which every possible group of individuals in the population has an equal probability, an equal chance of being selected for your sample. Now, let's look at an example in COVID-19. When COVID-19 spread to New York City, the city only provided tests to people who showed symptoms. However, with this virus, some infected people don't show symptoms. So the sampling method leads to an underestimate of the number of people infected because you're not testing anyone who doesn't show symptoms but might still be infected. So it was a biased sampling method. And so we were underestimating the number of people in the population that might have COVID-19, which can lead to devastating effects because you might open things up early without there being reason to. So instead, maybe we could have randomly sampled the New York City population and just test and tested everyone who was sampled. That would lead to an unbiased estimate of the number of people infected because then you might cover the people who are not showing symptoms as well and get a real estimate of how far it spread. So, one free response question you might see is describe a way to do a random sample. So describe how you implement a simple random sample of 1,000 New York City residents to test for COVID. When you're describing a simple random sample, here are three things you should do. Assign each individual population uh, in population a number, a unique number to them. Use a random number generator to, attend, to obtain a sample of them, skipping repeats, so you're getting a random individual set and sample the individuals whose numbers came up in the random number generator. So this is one way to describe it. Assign every individual in New York City integer, one to n, where n is the actual population size in New York City. Everyone gets a unique number. Use a random number generator to obtain 1,000 integers between one and n, skipping repeats. We get 1,000 random numbers between one through n, and we skip repeats so we don't sample someone twice. Administer the COVID test to 1,000 1, individuals who have the numbers correspond to them. And that would be a way to get an unbiased sample. So now let's talk about Wald's, Abraham Wald's bullet hole problem. And we're gonna go through it here. So Abraham Wald, as part of his work for the statistical research group, collaborated with the British Air Force. The British Air Force sent bombers over Germany. And when they send bombers over Germany, often gunfire would strafe the bombers. And they noticed a lot of them were getting shot down. So they wanted to reinforce the planes with extra armor. Unfortunately, armor is heavy, so you can't put it everywhere. So they had to pick one part of the plane to put the armor on. And what they did was they took the planes that made it back from these bombing missions and were shot. So the planes that made it back, they, they, they took those, those, those planes and they charted out where the bullet holes were on the planes. They gave a bunch of these charts to Wald and they said, hello, statistician, please tell us where we should put the extra armor. This is a representative set of six of the planes, and uh, it's, it's a little simplified, but this is kind of the general idea of what was going on. And this is courtesy of her professor, Joseph Liston, who's an amazing professor. Um, and the question I have for you is, the discussion is, based on this data, if you were in Wald's shoes, where would you put the extra armor? On the nose of the plane, the front of the plane, the main wings, the main body, the engines, or the tail? and why. Please provide a statistical reason for your answer, and we'll talk about it in class. Have a good one, statisticians. See you next time.